She takes on the world, carries out her plan. Hey everyone, Natalie McNeil here from She Takes on the World and I cannot tell you how excited I've been all day. I've been telling everyone that I get to interview Danielle Laporte today. She's a fellow Canadian and author of the Firestarter Yay. Sessions and I'm sure you've heard of her uh, this morning. Someone actually asked me, oh, who's Danielle Laporte? And I said, what do you mean you don't know who Danielle is? <laughs> And I took so much offense to it, Danielle. It's unbelievable. <laughs> thank you for being offended on my behalf. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. You're one of the people that people have been saying to interview for a really long time for our series. So I'm just so honored um, that you're here today. And I actually read the Firestarter Sessions when it was our Victoria Day long weekend because we are Canadian and that's what we do. We're part of the Commonwealth. So I had a jacuzzi suite in Niagara Falls and read the Firestarter Sessions and took a lot of notes. Um, and I'll just dive right in here. But one of the first things, you know, at the beginning of the book is you talk about being at this fork in the road. And you can choose your way or you can choose their way. Mm -hmm. So for you, have you always chosen your way or was there a time when you were following the their way path and how did you find your way back? Mm -hmm. I have definitely not always chosen my way. Um, I mean, you know, part of my work history is that I ran a think tank in Washington, D.C. So I was executive director, I had like 20 or so futurists and we were paid to think very big thoughts for the likes of the Pentagon and um, it becomes like really easy to fake it in that kind of scenario. So, you know, black suits, I was wearing loafers and it was really painful and I felt like a big fat fake and I go, go home on the weekends and I read a lot of Rolling Stone and Rumi and smoke a lot of Marvel lights. Uh, so no, not always my way. I, mean, I think always, always as me as I could be. I think I put myself in, you know, just as me as I could be playing someone else's game. <laughs> so what was that turning point where it was like, I'm done with their way and now it's all about me, baby? Did yeah, you know? well, quitting, le leaving the think tank was a big deal, and I came back to Vancouver, I tried to get an art school, I got rejected from art school, I started another, you know, business that got big and fell apart, um, but really, leaving, leaving that world was a big deal. Um, I sold, one of the first things I did was I took all my clothes to consignment, I sold all of my suits, I mean, I looked at the loafers, I was like, who the I got those. I pierced my nose and dyed my hair red. I added to my tattoos. And really, that was a never again. But the thing is, with authenticity, <laughs> is you're always going to be a work in progress. So, you know, I thought I was myself then. And then I got into another situation. And, and I was too quiet. You know, I looked like me. I had dread -like locks and I was wearing like a lot of linen. Um, but I was still not voicing all of me. And that came down. And I was like, never again. I shall never dummy down. I shall use the language of my soul, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I shall merge spirituality and fat money. Um, and now I'm that. Now I'm that. And now there's new never agains. You know, I'm about to tear my sight down. And I just spent a ton of money, like, in the last six months, rebuilding it and sprucing it um, for the Firestarter launch and making it Firestarter friendly and making it stranger friendly for all those people who are stumbling and coming from Facebook and getting referred and all of that and seeing me on shows. This is who I am as soon as you get here. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And then I'm just like, I'm so sick of myself. And it feels noisy and pushy. And it's worked. And it's beautiful. And it's what I designed and designed with my fantastic people. Um, yeah. And I, I can't get rid of it. <laughs> and 
I love, I know you've talked about this before actually where you say if there's something that's not working, it doesn't matter how much money you've put into it and how much time you've got to be able to, to let it go and move on. And I think that says a lot about your relationship with, with money and how maybe other entrepreneurs need to change their way of thinking about money. Like how, how do you let that go? Are you just completely okay with saying it's off the table, it's done, it's time for me to... <laughs> To move no, on. not completely okay with it. Um, I think what happens for solopreneurs who are who whose business is their personality, is the service that they offer. You know, there's, there's that that niche of us. Yeah. It's harder for us to let to to have loss as part of the bottom line because we're not producing widgets. And you know, like if you run a restaurant you know that you're going to write off food that comes in spoiled and damaged and it, you have a, you actually have a budget line item for wastage. And that's just part of running that business. We don't see it so much as wastage is a little more painful when it's your own blood, sweat, and money that's tied to your personality. But man, it's part of being creative. It's part of, you know, you, you throw your, you recycle your canvas, you burn your art, you tear up your photographs. You trash your website. Yeah. Now, is all of that part of for you? Because one of my favorite parts that I got to in the book is what you say about life purpose. And I think everybody mm -hmm. needs to hear this. Mm -hmm. Everyone, listen up. What Danielle okay, says I'll, is I'll, that I'll, I'll <laughs> tell you. How many you you say it, Danielle? You have that like soul, soul voice. So. so life purpose is what you say it is. That's it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what do you want it to be? Great, that's it. There you, you can go. breathe a sigh of relief. Danielle is giving you permission to let it go. So for you, is all of that part of the process of, I think in your book you word it as becoming you is your life purpose. So is all of that part of becoming you, you know, creating art, taking it off the table, changing up your websites, like just trying new things and putting yourself out there and being vulnerable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to be current with my consciousness and, you know, that's one of my core desired feelings is to feel innovative. I want to feel like I'm on my own creative edge, not somebody else's creative edge. I don't have to have, I don't need to be innovative in every scene and situation, um, but I, I want to do what feels fresh for me and I don't even identify with... Um, reinventing I don't I don't know why there's something I never think about this like I've talked to my shrink there's something about uh, the whole idea of reinvention that makes me uncomfortable because you know I'm very much a purist it's all about getting just distilling things down and saying just what I really want to say and I love consistency and I do get attached to to fonts <laughs> Um, I'm like that too. <laughs> you no, know, I think it's just I just want to be me all the time. I want to be sincere, so I want that consistency. Um, and I think I just went off on a tangent. Well, I was. That's okay. That's what I love about you. Um, one of the <laughs> things I was talking to this group of girls, and they're getting ready to graduate from college, university, and I was telling them, oh, you should really pick up the fire starter sessions because some of them are feeling a little bit lost. And do you have any, what advice would you give to 21-year-old Danielle? Oh, sleep around. 21-year-old, <laughs> <laughs> um, go after the cow, that cowboy, you should have, yeah. Um, the world needs what you've got. Like you're, you're important. Uh, be careful with your credit cards. I would have sat myself down and had a conversation with myself about quality, quality spending, and investing. Like this was something I didn't get for a long time. I didn't get these lessons when I was younger, but I didn't get the idea of. Just buy one really great sweater for for whatever the going rate is that's pricey, you know, instead of five shitty acrylic sweaters. Just like invest in quality things. And then it, you invest in the right tools. Like if you need technology to do your job, 
then you get the state-of-the-art stuff so you can do your job. And this lesson translates to relationships, right? Just like, just go deeper with this, with one person and dump the chump and quality, 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 which always has to do with resonance. What one person thinks is quality is going to be different for somebody else. Um, yeah, it gets back to believing that your quality, your your opinion matters. I think I would have talked to myself too about talking up in meetings. Anything that involved a boardroom, I, uh, <clears throat> I think I should have said it a lot more along the way. Mm -hmm. I think that's great advice, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure our audience would agree. So, this book that you just wrote that is so exciting and birthing a book. Um, I had my own book published this year, and it was I've just learned so much from that. Did you have a moment? Wait, hold on. What's your book? My book is She Takes on the World, also based on the site. Do I have a? I probably have a copy it's somewhere. Here. There's one. <laughs> uh, right on. <laughs> great. Um, so, yes, the birth process. Sorry, sorry. What was yeah, the end? What was the end? Then? What's well, the question? What was the for you? Did you have a, a point where, whether writing the book or when it was published, where you just had a big, massive, wow, this is my life moment, where it felt kind of, kind of surreal. Whether it was like people showing up for you or, just mm -hmm. like the experience of writing a book, and I, I find that you learn, well, you always learn so much doing anything, but you learn so much about yourself, and did you have one of those moments in your book birthing <laughs> process? Uh, if I get the moment question, I, um, well, it was a long gestation, right? So I created this digital experience and moved a lot of that online first, and always with the intention that I wanted to go to print. And so, you know, it's a great lesson, a great dream come true, really, of really beginning with the end in mind. Um, I wanted to put it out there online and, and have a publisher call, and I did. Um, uh, my an awful public moment. One of the favorite pieces of feedback I've had from the book is when somebody said they read it and they felt like they were further along than they've been giving themselves credit for. And that really got me. Um, because, you know, one thing I've gotten clear on is that what I habitually naturally do is, is encourage people. Now, I have a way of doing it. I'm, like, super practical about it. I get called, like, you know, tough love a lot. Uh, but, like, with extra love. Um, so I was really happy that I had encouraged I, that someone was getting encouraged. Yeah, and, I think and then my New York book launch party was pretty epic for me. It was, it was a great culmination of uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. And I, I think starting with the end in mind is a really important lesson for a lot mm -hmm. of people really who want to write books because there are a lot of people out there who want to write a book. I talk to people all the time who just don't know where to begin and and actually that's a a good little slip for your big beautiful book plan because I purchased that and will definitely put the link uh, below this interview too because I think that gives a lot of really great advice yeah. for people. Any other advice for people who are authors and want to tell their story but just haven't got it out there yet? Well, you know, writers need to write and write it online, write letters, make little books that only your family are going to see. Just write. Like I hear this also from coaches who aren't coaching. Just get five people together in your living room and coach, and it'll come together. Uh, so I, I also often say, like, your life is your content. So you know, and I talk about this in your big beautiful book plan, which I'm is something I'm very very proud of. I mean, I can just like in all integrity say, you want to write. You need to get your big, beautiful book plan because we talk about agents and a little bit on the changing landscape. But this is really this is the map about how to build a book. Oh, this is this is what happens when you're live. Um, and and really approaching your book as it's a business. 
but back to your life being content. This is about mining your journals. It's about um, paying attention to everything any client has ever asked you. What it, or friend, what's the advice that you're repetitively giving to people? What are people coming to you for? Um, one thing I learned from a speaking uh, coach, I work with a woman named Gail Larson, and this, this idea totally turned around how I, how I, you know, what I write about and what I speak about is, she said that usually what happens is when we think about writing a piece or, or speaking, we think about what our topic's going to be, and then we look for stories in our past that are going to support that thesis, you know? But really, it's the other way around. You should look at, you should do this, sorry, you should do this mental sort of inventory of what are all the stories that have just stayed with you, that are still living in your psyche. Because the reason you've remembered them is because they're meaningful to you. And those are the stories that want to be told. And when I just sort of did, I dug into my own psychic archives, I just realized every story really led to, was a part of like my theory of living. Um, so every story, every, you know, what are the best stories you've had with your clients, with your own creative struggles? Those, those are the moments. Those are the teachables. Yeah. And once people have that, that idea and they have their passion and they know what they want to do, that, that whole creation process is often really challenging for people. And I love your, uh, I think it's called the creative visualization process in yeah. your room. Can you yeah. share that? Because I think that's yeah. really magical for mm. when you want to create. This is something that I still do myself. I've just come off of this retreat and I, and I did it there. So it's very simple. The idea is that you just picture yourself in a space that really feels enveloping and great. And that could be like a church, it could be a cafe, whatever. What's a great space that you want to be in? And then imagine that the product that wants to be created, the product, the service, the work of art, however you want to think about it, is standing outside your door, the door of that room, and it wants to come in. And you really look at, like, how do you feel? Do you feel scared? Do you feel like it's going to be bigger than you? Is there great anticipation? Are you excited? And what comes through the door? Um, and sometimes, you know, when you visualize things, we get to a deep discussion about meditation, visualization, but sometimes things can just show up abstract, like, you know, a set of running shoes could show up in your visualization. You'd be like, what's that? Well, you unpack what that means for you. Like Carl Jung says, only, only the dreamer can interpret the dream. Um, but I said, just get specific. Like what wants to show up? And who knows what's going to float through? It's going to be a book. It's going to be a new service. And then ask that vision, that image, to tell you about itself, to tell you how to get to it to tell you how it wants to be sold in the world, um, how it wants to be packaged. Like your dreams, if you ask your dreams, your dreams have information to give you. And sometimes your dream is saying, not now. I'm sort of floating in your psyche, but I'm not meant to be on the shelf for another three years. And then look at how you feel, again, about what showed up. And then part of that imagery is you take that product, service, work of art, into your body, just breathe that in, and you look at how you feel. I love that. I think it's brilliant. Well, you're brilliant. I have just one more thing. I've got to share with you that this was my biggest aha in the book. Okay. Whatever is on your plate has got there because you said yes to it. <laughs> yeah. I read that and I was like, yes. <laughs> so true and I think so easy to forget sometimes and I just I read that and it was like it my heart started pounding and I'm like yeah yeah I get it now it's there because I said it was I said yes to it even if I shouldn't have I knew it shouldn't have been put on my plate and into my life right now and I said yes and I think that's a really important lesson for people mm -hmm. to learn as well so I just wanted to share that with you and just thank you again for being here with us today. And everyone needs to go and pick up a copy of the Firestarter Sessions. And actually, <laughs> one person who leaves a comment below is going to win a copy. So that's really exciting, too. So make sure you leave us a comment below. 
and I'll put a link to Danielle's brilliant, big, beautiful book plan as well. So Danielle Laporte, thank you so, so much. And uh, I just, I love this. Thank you for being you and for bringing us all your amazing poetic blog posts and, and prose and books. And I'm sure there's lots more to come from you. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're so shiny. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>